Welcome to this lesson on writing sequential files and more. After reviewing this lesson, you will be able to use the split function, remove an item from a list box, align columns of information, use the strings.space method, code the form closing event procedure, and write records to a file. All right, now that you've had a chance to explore a little bit of um, the uh, stream reader, uh, let's take a look at some uh, things that are really useful to do uh, with data that's being read from a stream. Um, mostly we're talking about parsing and formatting that data. So here I have a very simple program. Uh, I've got uh, my files demo form. I've got a text box on it and I've got a record, uh, a, a button to delete records, and we'll explore that later. And uh, let's take a look at the sample data I've set up. So let's go over to the Solution Explorer until it show all files, and I'm gonna drill down into the um, uh, bin directory in debug. This project is, is set as a debug project currently, so this is the default, uh, if I don't specify a file path, where data is going to be created, where files are going to be written or read from. And uh, I've got a file out here that I created with uh, Notepad, and uh, let's open that up and take a look at it. So it has seven lines, um, and it has uh, uh, Fred, Wilma, and Pebbles, Flintstone, and then uh, Barney, Betty, and Bam Bam Rubble, and uh, the odd fish out here is George Jetson, who really doesn't uh, uh, fit. He would follow in the uh, next half hour of cartoons for those who are cartoon fans. Um, so um, I've got uh, sort of an odd collection, last names, then a delimiter of comma, a space, and first names of the individual. Okay, and that's all as a text file. And at the end of each is a new line, carriage return character, so carriage return line feed. Uh, to in the record, and that's fairly typical. All right, so um, let's go back and take a look at our form and our existing form code. So here's our form, and in the um, event of the form load, when the form loads, that's where I'm going to do my reading. So I'm not uh, offering that up through an interface uh, in the menu. Uh, for the user to choose to do it, it's just going to happen automatically when the form loads. And we're going to first check and see that this file containing the data exists. Um, if it doesn't, then nothing happens. We probably ought to um, evolve that so it shows some sort of error message or tell you, tells you that there's a problem or um, initializes and creates a default file, some way of handling that. But we're just keeping this simple. So it checks to make sure that it exists. If it does, I've got a stub here, and a stub is a function or a subroutine, a procedure that I'm going to uh, create later. If you go looking for init UI, where I'm going to set up some headings, um, that's kind of forward looking. If you actually go look at init UI right now, the procedure exists, but it doesn't do anything. It only contains a comment. And that's a really powerful technique for um, you know, sorting up setting up placeholder code for stuff I'm going to get to. I'm going to do it uh, later. Right now, it doesn't do anything, or I could even make it, uh, you know, send a message or something about, hey, this is this this is under construction. This functions or this subroutine is not complete. Um, you have more work to do, something like that, or set up a dummy value that it would return, you know, or, or do some simple thing. I may need to add a lot more sophistication to fully flesh out the code later. In any event, we can pretty much ignore that. I could even comment that whole thing out right now it doesn't do anything as yet we'll make it do something later okay this should all be reviewed at this point by the way um, with regard to what we're doing in the in the file reader you've done this already so we check to see if the file exists we set up a, uh, a file reader on uh, uh, called names file and uh, we're going to open the uh, names.dat into that file reader and then we're just going to do a loop. And we're going to keep looking and say, as long as there's, his peak is negative one, which is to say, as long as there's more data, then do something here. We're going to, we're going to read that, that record is what we're going to do. Um, I've got my note here. I've stubbed out that code as well. I need to do some stuff there. And then um, 
names file dot close. Okay, so um, when we're all done, we clean up and, and make sure we put away the um, uh, stream reader that we created because we don't want to be consuming system resources when we don't need to. So when we're all done, we always make sure that we clean up. Okay, so let's take a look um, in what we should have here. Let's just make sure things are working. And so how about we take and uh, uh, take that um, record that we're, we're reading and uh, uh, let's just uh, take um, and do names file dot read line and that's going to get the contents of the next record and maybe we could just initially print that out to the immediate window to the debug okay all right so let's run this code so far and see what it does so it runs and if we come over to the immediate window there's the contents of our file exactly as it was and that's fine except that I'd really like to display that in my list box and uh, um, that's fairly simple to do however I'd really like to display it first name and then last name and I'd like to ditch the comma and I'd like to ditch the extra space so here's our first lesson on some of the related or associated uh, functions that can be used in parsing the data to clean it up and start to format it. And so what we're going to do on this principally is we're going to use a method called the split method. Okay, so let's end that run and let's uh, take, uh, we're going to get rid of this line debug.print, but I'm going to keep the the core of it because we're still going to be doing some file reading and what I would like to do after reading that line is let's call the split method and split oops split allows me to break up the elements of a single record based on the delimiter we're using a comma as a delimiter and it will put them each one into its own one dimensional string array okay so we're going to split that into different fields at the comma character okay and so this is going to be what is this is going to return is a um, one-dimensional array. Let's put a breakpoint so we can see what that looks like and we'll add um, that element to what we're debugging, what we're, what we're watching and see it. Oh. What did I miss? Oh, we've just kind of got this sitting here. We need to do something with it. So, um, tell you what, let's temporarily define a uh, one dimensional array as string. Dim temp string as string array there we go so as an array of string okay and let's see if we say temp string equals that I think it should now be happy oh, still got something in broken in my read line 
names file dot read line. Oh, dot, forgot the dot split function. That's what it's all about. Okay, dot split. Okay, so now we're going to be um, taking the results, and this is creating a one dimensional string array and dropping it into temp string. Let's set a breakpoint here, and we can see how that changes. So let's set it on the next line. All right, and let's run that. And let's come over to our watch and um, let me clean this up a little bit. And let's see what temp string looks like currently. Okay, so currently it's nothing because it hasn't been initialized until we run one more line. So if we hit the F10 button, we'll step over that. And now we can expand temp string out and we can see that the zero element is the last name and the one element is the first name. Now it did catch the leading space there, but remember the comma, because we said the comma is the delimiter, delimiter, the comma has gone away. Okay, so what we need to do to clean this up a little bit at some point is we probably ought to trim that uh, first name string. But now if we wanted to output them in a different order, so let's see what we could do with that. If we were to say uh, print print temp string one and then uh, we wanted to print uh, with that a uh, space and then temp string zero. Ah, so now we have the first name before the last name. And if we want to clean up that first name a little bit, we could take that first string and we could uh, trim it. Nice, so now we have the first name and the last name. So we can use that same technique in populating our list box as we intend. And again, what we're going to do here is rather than um, uh, having to have all of our formatting code here, because our formatting code we might change, we might repurpose it to go to different controls or, or different kinds of formats. So rather than putting the code complexity in here, now here's where we're going to call one of those functions that we mentioned earlier. So um, let's see here. Let's take populate GUI, and what we'd really like to do with that populate GUI is it's going to take the current record, pass to it as a string array, and it's going to format it nicely. And we'll just use what we just learned. So if we take and add it to the items collection of the names list box and what we're adding is oh that's the header that's this is for our, our, our formatting the the heading on that let's not do that part let's do it this way so we're going to take list box names items we're going to add to it the current record element one which is of course the, the second element. Zero is the first element. We're going to trim it to get rid of the space. And here's another handy string function. We're going to pad it right to a total length of 15. And what happens if we take each of those first name names and pad them right to a total of 15, I think 15 is longer than any of our first names. What we're going to do is we're going to get a nice clean aligned column edge uh, between the first names and the last name, and then we'll concatenate on the current record zero, which is the last name. So here we flipped around, 
it was last name first, so we're putting the first name, then padding it to 15 characters using spaces, and we're going to then print the last name. Let's take a look. So this is called populate UI, and we need to pass it the current record. And so back here, we no longer need this temp string. And this expression that was temp, temp string is going to be the expression for the current record. Let's wrap that whole thing in a hug. And what we want to do is send that to our populate UI function. Right. And again, the benefit of breaking out this in a separate procedure, we could put all that code right here, but by breaking it out in a separate procedure, later on, if we want to uh, have it go populate different controls, or if we want to change the formatting, we got a, a small separate code base that we can work on here to make those changes. So that's that's kind of good modular programming. But let's test this and see if it's working so far. Nice. Okay, so there's Fred, and the original space was stripped out, but then it's re-expanded to a total of 15, and Flintstone, Wilma and Flintstone, and even though the first names would make it all wiggly, if we didn't have that, that pad string in there, um, uh, we've got a nice alignment there. So we're actually seeing, we're getting a twofer here in this lesson. Um, we're seeing the split function, and we're seeing the pad string. We'll revisit the pad string in a minute. As a matter of fact, let's take a look and see what it would look like without that. So if I come up here and get rid of the padding on that with pad right, and just put in an empty space and run it, there we go. So we see it's all, all the columns are kind of munched together. And so we're not seeing a nice separation between the first and the last name. But the focus here is on what that split is doing for me. And that split, I'm parsing that right here. And again, split is passing me a string array, one dimensional string array with uh, those fields up. Now I've, I've only had it parsing the two, but if it was, if there were more than that, if it was a middle name in there as well, we would get three fields, field zero, field one, and field two. And so um, you can accommodate as many fields as you want. Your uh, one dimensional array will just have additional um, uh, elements in the, the index uh, for it so that we can reference the different fields by their field number. Okay, first name right now is field number one last name is field zero and by uh, swapping them around we can print it first name last name order all right let's leave that here take this uh, code you're welcome to model some code on it and experiment with it it's really the best way to see what's going on with this for yourself in our last lesson we uh, were working with the stream reader and we took some data and we formatted it um, to rearrange the uh, uh, fields of the records that we were reading so that we had first name last. And just to um, revisit that, we come over and look at the original data, names.dat, seven lines, and it's last comma first. We used the split function, and then we rearranged the fields with the first name printed and then the last name. And so let's go ahead and see that in operation to refresh our recollection. And so here it is, Fred and Flintstone. And what we'd like to do now is we'd like to see about um, uh, arranging these columns of first names and columns of last names so that you can see clearly the, uh, the, the uh, separation of the columns. Okay. And so we sort of foreshadowed how to do that using the uh, uh, pad string functions. So let's take a look at that again. And uh, 
here's our routine that is populating the UI. This is our, our output, our display routine. And so see how easy it is for me to just go right to that routine and I don't have to go digging through a lot of other code. So calling this out in a separate procedure is really handy. Get, again, good modular programming. I can go right to what I want to work on. If I have problems with it, I can debug just that area. I've only got a couple lines of code to look at. I don't have to debug <clears throat> you know, thousands of lines of code to find the piece that I'm looking for. So benefit of modular programming. And what I would like to do now is instead of having these separated by a space, I want to take that field of the current record. So that's our, our first name. And I would like to pad it out. And the other thing I need to do is I need to trim it because there was an extra space that came with it uh, when I broke it at the comma because it was last name, comma, space, first name. So trim will get rid of that extra space. Okay. Let's see how that looks just like that. Okay, so see now there's no space, but I, now I need to push all the last names out so that they're aligned. I want to push them out to the same length. And so I can, on top of the trim, I can add another method, and I'm going to use pad right. And pad right is going to pad the existing string to as a fixed number of spaces. Let's make it 15 spaces and then print the, the la, uh, last name. Nice. Okay. So there we have that. One other thing about um, uh, aligning this is that um, notice that I have a different font here. This is courier font. And remember that in Windows, most fonts are proportionally spaced. What does proportionally spaced mean? That means a, a small, tiny little letters like lowercase i or f or lowercase j are very narrow. And some, arrow, some letters like capital M and capital W are very wide. And if we're trying to, to get it to align by spaces, we need to use a font in which every letter takes up the same amount of space, a non-proportionally spaced font. So let me show you what else I did in, in fixing that. Let's go back to our form. And so um, in here, instead of going with the default, let's pick a nice uh, proportionally spaced uh, font. Like, uh, uh, how about... Um, uh, let's see, Arial. So if we do this in Arial, Arial and uh, Arial narrow, that's fine. And we put it up about uh, oh, 10 and run that. Notice that our columns are all wiggly again. And the reason they're wiggly is that some letters take up more space than others, so it doesn't put them out to the same exact distance. Okay, and so there's nothing wrong with our code. We just haven't anticipated what they call font metrics. Now, there are uh, programmatic techniques that if you wanted to use a proportionally spaced font, you can do some other string handling on the font metrics to get it to align. Um, and if you're interested in exploring that, I commend that to you uh, as an independent study. We're not going to dig into font metrics, but it is a soluble, very tractable problem. And as you would expect, just in, in, involves some more string handling and um, uh, some, some uh, methods that will allow us to uh, determine the font attributes in order to line things up. I'm going to take the easy way out for instructional purposes, and we're going to go back and change this to courier new and now we have a nice non-proportional lines very nicely all right i think we'll leave this uh, lesson there for now All right, let's uh, finish off our display of our records in our list box by adding a, um, a column header 
up here and if you remember our original code I'd stubbed off in my design before I really started programming in earnest I had thought about how this thing would work and I'd stubbed off uh, something called init UI initialize the user interface and I made myself a little comment to do place code here to set up the headings and where is this called from init UI which it's currently being called it just doesn't do anything because we haven't put any code in it is being called before anything has been written to the list box okay so one of the things we could do here is um, we could add to the list box um, our uh, column uh, headings and do that as the very first element it'll go in automatically uh, on the add to element zero and then uh, we'll have our heading in there before anything else gets added and that's probably the easiest way to to do that and so um, how would we do that well we could do something like this this box name items add and we could say first and a few spaces and last and see how that looks okay well it's not lined up so we could keep guessing and we could keep trying to figure it out but there's another nifty little function that's very handy for formatting and uh, adding spaces you know sort of as a fill and fill would have been a good name for it but they call it uh, the space function and if we do the math we were putting our um, first and then 15 and if we count the letters in first one two three four five and 15 what we really need right here is 10 spaces and I could do it by hand I could you know sp hit space 10 times but probably a better way to do that is to use the strings object and we'll call the space method and just say add 10 spaces in there and then last and that should if our math is correct that should line it up perfectly let's give it a shot yay so now we have first and last and it's all lined up beautifully all right so that using the string function the string method space and then all we do is tell it the number of spaces we want to generate and it does that for us All right, so our program is coming along swimmingly, but now I'd like to deal with that uh, niggly detail we noticed earlier, and that is that we have um, all of the characters from Bedrock, from uh, the, the Flintstones, but we have this one odd character, George Jetson, who really belongs in the series from the Jetsons. So that, that really looks like an error. We want to be able to remove that. So we need to provide some way to uh, delete that element from the list box okay and so we need to explore the method for that and I'm going to do that via a delete uh, button okay so let's go look at the code for the buttons click event and so what do we want to do uh, when clicked delete the selected element from the list box items collection okay so we're going to need to know how do we know which is the selected element from the um, uh, the list box okay so let's see the expression for what is currently selected is lb names is the list box dot selected item okay so this expression is the thing that is currently selected let's wrap that in a hug 
So now that I've got the current thing, what I would like to do is remove it. And there's uh, a method on the items collection called remove, and we'll use that. List box names, the items collection, the remove method, and well, that's just great. Okay. And uh, let's see, I think in my default form, I currently have the delete record is the button is um, disabled. So let's enable that and see how this works. Okay. And so come over here and select George Jetson and bam, I can delete it and um, happiness and joy, except I noticed something else. I can select the element zero, which is my headings, and I really don't want you to be able to delete those. Um, I do want you to be able to delete other records that you select if that's what you want to do. But I really didn't want you to be able to delete the headings. So I ought to put some code in there that's going to restrict that. And uh, uh, let's see. I think it would also be nice if this delete record button is not hot when nothing is selected. Because right now nothing's selected. What happens if I hit delete? What happens? We don't know. Try it. Well, nothing happens, so that seems to be okay. But wouldn't it be better to tell the user that nothing's going to happen? Because the user might be going, why isn't it doing what I want it to do? Well, we need to give them some context. So let's turn it off unless something here is selected. So let's see how we can do that. Okay, so how about on the selected index changed, let's make that the part that enables our button. So button delete record dot enabled equals true. Okay, so that'll enable it. So let's go back and disable it by default. And see how that works. Okay, good. This is more like it. So I can't do anything. The button is dead until I select something. Once I select something and something's selected, I can delete it. Oops, now I'm back in a situation where I've left it enabled even though nothing is selected. And again, I'm going to cause the user some confusion. So I need to disable that button when that button is clicked. Okay, so that's easy enough. Let's come into the uh, event for this button. And when it's been clicked, it does its thing. And then it becomes disabled again. So it's disabled until I select something. And then it deletes it. Oh, and it's disabled again. Well, let's see. What if I select something again? Oh, and it's enabled again. Oh, this is neat. That, that tells me as a user um, when I can do something and when I can't. But I still have a problem. Look here. I haven't done anything to stop that. Okay. So what I need to do, let's think about this, is when I try and delete something, if it's the zero index element or if it's equal to that headings string, you could do either one, um, I need to say, nope, I'm not going to allow it. I'm not going to do anything with that. So um, the delete button is going to have no effect on that. Okay. So what I really need to do there is um, uh, say, you know what? If the selected index is not 
equal to zero. Then, and I'll put a comment here, disallow deleting of the heading. So if that's true, then you can do these things. Spell it correctly. So if I'm if I'm not trying to the list box names, uh, if I'm trying to delete delete the heading, I'm not allowed. So the zero index element I can't delete. But if it's anything else, I can delete it. Let's see if that's now doing what we want it to do. Okay. So can I delete George Jetson? Yes. Can I delete Pebble Slintstone? Yes. Can I delete first last? No. It just goes dead stick until I select something else. What if I come back up here again? Can I fake it out? Nope. Anytime I've selected the zero element, it's not going to let me delete it. So I could even, uh, you know, uh, if that's selected, I could put additional logic to make sure the delete record goes dim, or I could. Um, uh, pop up a message that tells you you can't delete the heading or maybe ask you if you really do want to delete the heading. Um, it depends on what we want to do as a programmer, but uh, nifty. So here we have, and the focus is the remove method on the items collection of the list box. And the other thing that we use that hand in hand with is, in this case, the selected item. The other form here is we can remove at a specific number if we have determined programmatically what index number we want to delete. We could we could say remove it at this index. Um, so that would be another way to address that. And I'm going to leave that for you to explore. By this point, you've noticed that a lot of times we have some housekeeping to do in setting up our applications environment for running, and that a great place to do that was in the form load event. So when the form is loading, we can do all kinds of things. And in here, we set that up to do our automatic reading of our data file and populating our user interface. And that's great. But there's another time when we have to do housekeeping. So you do housekeeping when company's coming over, right? You also have to do housekeeping after a company goes home. So after the party is cleanup time. So another great event for us to code uh, to do cleanup is form closing. So let's think about what we want to do in the form closing for this application. So you've read some files, or uh, read a data file, you maybe have made some changes to it, and we'd like to output it in the new format. So originally it was just comma delimited, last name first, and we'd like to um, send it out now in the format we have with the first name and several spaces and then an aligned column with the, the last name. So we transformed it, plus we may have deleted records from it as well. I haven't added functionality to insert that, but I think by extension, you could see that it'd be another thing to your logical next step for developing uh, this application. Okay, so we'll leave that part for you as uh, something to explore independently, but let's see about form closing. Well, at this point, if, you're, if you've made those changes and you don't want to lose them, this would be your last chance before the application is um, uh, unloaded uh, and has quit to save that data. Okay, so let's see how we would um, create a, uh, an event to handle that in form loading. And so um, let's see, how about we put a message box in here and we could say do you want to save changes and let's make the message box style 
a yes no message box and let's give it a caption of form is closing okay and so we haven't done anything with that yet we've just created a prompt let's see how that works all right so we load up our form maybe we make some changes to it and then we go to close our application and it says form is closing do you want to save changes right now i haven't coded either the yes or the no event so it really doesn't matter what we do and it just closes okay so we really need to do some processing here to determine what if we said yes you do want to save the the, the changes okay well, the message box is going to return, if it's got yes, no buttons, it's going to return um, a value. Um, it's going to be an integer value, but we don't even have to know that integer value. We can check it against the uh, default system constant VB yes or VB no. And so we can say, you know what? If this whole thing equals VB yes, then what do we want to do here to do add code to write the file and let's debug dot print simulating writing the file And then the other thing we need to do here, well, let's test it for now and see if that's doing what we want it to do. Oh, I've got a glitch. Oh, got to wrap it in a hug. There we go. So here we are. I'm going to clear the immediate window so we can see clearly and unambiguously what's going on with our interface. And we make a change and then we close. Do you want to save the changes? Uh, what if I say yes? Simulating writing the file. What if I say no? It shouldn't write the file, right? So let's run it again. We should get nothing out there. Run it again. Do exactly the same thing. Let's clear our immediate window and let's close it. Do you want to save the changes? No. And it didn't give us the message in the output window. So uh, just to double check that, see there's no message out there. So this is only happening for the yes part. So looking forward, what we have to do is add the code to write the file and we'll need to, to do that. We're gonna to have to explore the stream writer and we'll do that in the next lesson. All right, now we're ready to bring this lex uh, lecture and this lesson home by adding the code to uh, write our file. And we're gonna do that in the form closing event. And we left ourselves a little to do comment add the code to write the file we temporarily stubbed it off by um, saying simulating the writing of the file here so we're done with that simulation that message we need to really do this and we're going to do that now so I'll get rid of that comment and so here's where we need if we're going to write the file we need to write the code so we've already decided we are going to write the file the user has said yes and then what do we need well let's see here um, we're going to need to write individual records. So let's declare record as string. And then we're going to need a stream writer. So let's declare, call it out file as io.streamwriter. And 
then we need to output to a file. And we're just going to overwrite that file if it already exists. So I'm not even going to check to see if it already exists. There's no need. If it, if it does exist, we're overwriting it. If it doesn't exist, we'll create it. And so out file equals IO file create text new names. We call, call the original one names.dat. Let's call this one new names.dat. And then we need to walk down every element in that list box except the very first one if we don't want to save the heading with the file. So if we do want to save the heading with the file, that would be simpler. But let's skip the, the first one. And we could do this a couple different ways. One strategy is find out how many elements there are. Um, so if there are uh, seven elements in the list box, we could skip number zero and, and write one, two, three, four, five, and six, and that would be fine. So we could use a loop for that. I'm gonna use a for each loop. For each automatically knows the size of the collection and it will visit each element in that collection. Okay, so for each record in LB names, and the name of the collection is called items, do something. Okay, and what are we going to do? Well, let's see. Um, we'll worry in a second about how to skip the header. So let's start just by writing the whole thing with the header. Um, we want to take our stream writer out file and write, but I don't want to write and then have all the records end up on one line. I want one line per record. So it's going to be uh, delimited by uh, a carriage return line feed or new line uh, at the end of each record. So I'm going to use the write line function. And then the contents I'm going to write is that string that we just got called record. And uh, good. But we got to remember to clean up after ourselves, right? Always, you know, wash and dry and put away the dishes when you're, when you're done with the meal. And so we also need to come down here before we leave and take the out file and close it. Okay. So that'll, that'll put that object away. We're all done with it. Don't leave things open because if the program ends with it open, you're hoping that the uh, runtime system will automatically clean up after you, and most of the time it will, but you know, you're also inviting problems. You should really clean those things up, not leave things hanging out in memory, which can cause what we call a memory leak, where we start allocating memory and we never give it back to the system. Um, uh, VB is pretty good about automatic garbage collection, but again, um, let's have a uh, professional programming standard here and always clean up after ourselves and have nice tight code with no leaks. All right, let's give this a try and see what happens. So I've read it in. I'm going to delete George Jetson. I'm going to close. It says, do you want to save the changes? And I'm going to say yes. And now if we've done things properly, oh, Here's new names .dat. That didn't exist a minute ago. Let's open it up and oh look, it's got our header in it and then first names in the first column and rather than last name comma first, it's first name, spaces and a nice aligned column and Flintstone and Barney, spaces and rubble. It's all nicely aligned um, and so just the way we want it. The one thing we'd like to get rid of is let's make this data only uh, if we decided we didn't want to put the headings in there or the field names. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, put this away. And we need to do something. Where can we figure out? So that just as soon as we're about to write the very first one, here's where we're writing to the, the, the uh, uh, the file oh that's not where we're doing it this is where we're writing the record to the file 
And this is why internal documentation comments can be so handy, is they can help you to navigate and see what you're doing. So what we want to do is we want to do this. We want to write that for each file except or unless it happens to be that very first heading. And we can do that by figuring out if it's the zero index. I'm going to do it in this case by just checking the contents. Okay. So I'm going to say if record not equal to FIRST 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, capital L A S T. Now I could use my um, uh, string dot spaces uh, expression. We could do that uh, as well. Um, I'll mix it up here. Then do this thing. So if it's not the header, we're going to write the, the, the record. So we're going to write the record if it's not the header. But the first one, which is going to match that, it does nothing. It doesn't write anything. So let's see if that now works as we intended when the form closes. Give it a run. Delete George Jetson. And let's close. Do you want to save the changes? Yes. And now let's come back up here and look at new names.dat. And oh, beautiful. There's no heading. And we got Fred, Wilma, Pebbles, Barney, Betty, Bam Bam, and no George Jetson at the end. So it is now working perfectly. And we have learned how to code the form closing event. And we've learned how to use a stream writer to complement our knowledge of using a stream reader. And uh, we even cleaned up after ourselves. Did we remember to clean up when we were done with the file we were reading from? Look back in the form open event, form load event. So when the form loads, yep. When we were done, we closed the stream reader. We've closed our stream writer. So we've got the dishes put away, company's gone, the house is clean, and it's time to relax. In this lesson, you learn to use the split function to read delimited records from a file. Use the items.remove method or items.removeAt method to remove an item from a list box or combo box. Use the pad left, pad right methods to align columns of information in the interface. Use the strings.space method to include a specific number of space characters in a string. Code the form closing event, which occurs when a form is about to close. And finally, you learned how to write records to a file, separating each in a new line in the file. This concludes the lesson.